Madam President, members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be joining you here this evening on the occasion of this dinner to mark your organization's 20th anniversary. I understand that you started the celebrations some months ago with a lecture by a world and Olympic champion. I hope I can compete. Though grit and resilience is something we also know about here in Brussels. Age 20 in 2013, this makes you exactly as old as the single market. By the way, I delivered a speech this afternoon at the occasion of the 50th anniversary of another association. And at that occasion, I was quoting the famous French poet and novelist, Victor Hugo. And he says, when you are 40, it is la vieillesse de la jeunesse. When you are 50, la jeunesse de la vieillesse. But I'm not quoting Victor Hugo now, but when you are 20, C'est la jeunesse de la jeunesse. <laughs> and I'm more and more in the stage of becoming, of coming to the stage of la vieillesse de la vieillesse. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, exactly 20 years after the launching of the single market is not a coincidence for your organization. I couldn't have put it any better than you just did, Madam President, for the companies of all our countries, and especially in your sector, retail and wholesale, a true European market of over half a billion people has irresistible appeal. It did at the time and still does today. The single market came into being with Maastricht's entry into force two decades ago, almost to the day. With it came another major game changer, the journey to the euro. With the common currency, Europe entered into people's daily lives like never before. Through coins in people's pockets, banknotes in their wallets, and purse traded at shopping tills across the continent over a billion times a day. From the very beginning, business leaders like you were among the euro's most enthusiastic supporters. And this strong support was an important factor in its success. A common currency is about much more than just sharing a design of your banknotes. For a country, it means that your financial, economic, and budgetary decisions can have an impact on those of other member states. Yet the full extent of this reality what it really means to share a currency, a market, and a union only started to sink in in recent years. It took unprecedented financial turmoil to hammer home our extraordinary economic interdependence and the resulting need for Eurozone countries especially to coordinate financial, economic, and fiscal policies even more closely than before. Our countries have drawn and still are drawing the lessons from the economic and financial crisis. In these unsteady times, they have had to pull together like never before. And the union as a whole is hard at work. We have recovered financial stability, defeating, defeating the existential threat to the euro. No small feat to say the least. There is still much to be done to finish the reinforcing of our economies and of our financial system, completing, for instance, the banking union that is currently underway and that is designed to help restore normal credit throughout the union and prevent credit crunches in the future. But the main battle today is that of jobs. In too many countries, five years of low growth or no growth not to mention a recession, have taken a devastating toll on the employment, especially for young people. 
Growth is finally coming back, timidly, but still. The trend is there. I have to say that private consumption will not be the main driver of the recovery, certainly not in 2014. Consumer spending is expected to rebound in 2015 by 1.5% in the Union and 1.3% in the Euro area. As labor market conditions start improving more visibly and the recovery gains strength. But we know that there is always a time lag between the return of growth and that of jobs. So making it happen faster, helping bring jobs back, that remains the absolute priority, the ultimate goal. All the rest, financial stability, fiscal consolidation, structural reforms, are not aims in themselves, but means, means to bring back jobs, to restore sound and lasting economic foundations for our societies. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no secret. Business will be a major driving for a lasting recovery. Much is going to depend on our spirit of enterprise, on how business-minded we Europeans will prove we can be, how competitive we are. At the European Council, which I chair and which brings together the presidents and prime ministers of all the member states, leaders want to make sure that all is set so that companies like yours can play their part in leading Europe back to economic growth. Which is why I have insisted that we place such an emphasis on Europe's competitiveness each and every time we meet. It is important that we don't lose sight of the longer term trends behind some of our most immediate challenges. Take high energy prices, for instance, which weigh hugely on companies and consumers across Europe. Energy efficiency will be a key objective for the years to come. Above all, we need to acknowledge that without a genuine European single energy market, we are unlikely to compete well in the world where soon Europe will be the only continent that still needs to import energy from outside. It's the only way to come to terms with the global game changer like the shale gas revolution in the United States. Against this backdrop, and in our fast changing world, it becomes even more crucial to keep investing in the single market. Aside from energy, there are still too many sectors which we fall short from where we ought to be. Not least for services, for the digital economy, for the telecom sector, for transport infrastructure, all areas where the leap forward or the leap towards the single market would make a significant difference, including, of course, to retail and wholesale companies. To help boost the benefits for business, single market rules should, of course, be light and fit for purpose, striving for maximum simplicity and minimum hassle, especially for SMEs, that is a matter of common sense and the principle European Council leaders insist upon. The European Commission has already identified new steps to cut down paperwork and simplify EU law where needed. Single market routes, rules are living rules, and their whole purpose is precisely to reduce red tapes. Because when we get it right with the single market rules, it's 28 out and one in, a level playing field for all. But let us not forget that the biggest creators of red tape are still the national, regional, and local authorities, especially when they adopt conflicting in incompatible rules. A similar effort has thus to be made at all levels. For a trade like yours, single rules for lorry transport, for instance, have meant epic change. One single administrative document covering all cargo rather than the 20 odd pieces of paperwork that previously had to be presented at each border. In our day and age, the same should, be, should go, of course, for, to, for online borders. In fact, it is utterly paradoxical that it isn't. Yet the unfortunate truth is that when it comes to the online economy, Europe is still a truly fragmented market. 
Whereas we used to lead on all things digital, we are now lagging behind. We've invested too little in infrastructure, the skills and the organizational changes that are needed to reap the benefits of these technologies. And this is something we simply cannot afford. And nowadays, expanding through online channels, conquering the digital economy is not just for the Amazon and Ebays of this world, but an opportunity for all. Almost every single SME in our countries could improve its business by making better use of digital technology, of digital services, and digital selling channels. And the Christmas season is just around the corner, and more and more gifts will be bought online. That's the new reality. And yet, there are still huge differences between European member states. On average, nearly 60% of European internet users shop online. But this ranges from over 80% in the United Kingdom to under 30% in Estonia and Italy, which is surprising since we like to think of Estonia as an E country. But more worrying still are the low figures of consumers ready to buy online abroad, only one in 10. And most of online trading is concentrated within each country. We are back to national markets all over again. Much of this has to do with trust, with providing secure online payment means and guarantees for privacy and data protection. It should be as easy and safe to buy and sell online from another European country as it is at home, which is where European measures can and should help. Exactly one month ago, we devoted an entire European Council of Heads of State and Government precisely on how to achieve a more consumer-friendly digital economy, how to truly connect our continent in the digital age. And I was not surprised to hear these aims are the very top of your manifesto. But it goes deeper than just infrastructure and rules and regulations. What's also about is skills. The jobs of the future will be digital, at least in part. I often repeat this figure, but it's always as astonishing. As astonishing. By 2015, we're looking at finding ourselves with 900,000 900, unfilled IT vacancies. At a time when jobs are scarce, it's not hard to do the math. We seriously need to invest in digital skills. I will have to be, this will have to be a collective endeavor. Yes, it is going to happen in universities, in schools, and in homes. But to an equal extent, it's also going to happen in workplaces, in offices, in shops, in warehouses. And this is where tonight lies my call to you. Because investing in skills, in a wider sense, not just digital, means above all investing in people. And here the retail sector is uniquely placed. Because you represent a quarter of all companies in Europe. Because of your 30 million jobs. But also perhaps because for so many people, work life often starts with the summer or a student job in retail. Your collective reach means you are among the best place to help instill entrepreneurship further in our societies by giving opportunities to people, helping people grow. If you want to ensure we have the skills to match the needs of our economies, if you want to bridge the gap between the classroom and the workplace, then both those sides, schools and business, are going to have to work even closer together. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Union is ready to help. In fact, from January next year, all the funds which have been agreed for our next 2014-2020 budget will come into play with huge help for SMEs, 8 billion euro to support youth employment initiatives in the member states, and double the resources for digital training and retraining. Building on this, a company like Nestle, 
have already pledged to create 10,000 new jobs for under 30s and 10,000 new apprenticeships over the next three years. And we need more. Because governments can't solve this alone. It's only going to work if business gets involved. If you keep working as you already do with uh, your partners in national and local authorities to help get more apprenticeships, more vocational training, more coaching programs of the ground. Helping spread this entrepreneurial spirit when you work at a time. It's our surest path back to sustainable growth. Ladies and gentlemen, the private sector will be the growth driver. Its competitiveness is essential and will require attention from political authorities at all levels. In any case, the European Union will do its utmost to deepen and widen our single market, the biggest in the world, and to strengthen the economic and monetary union that is supporting our common currency, the euro. We are fighting, we are fighting the same battle, the battle for prosperity, our jobs, and our Europe. Thank you.